Um, the title of my book is Becoming Human, A Theory of Ontogeny. And the theory is a Neo-Vygotskyan theory. And what Neo-Vygotskyan theory means is um, two things. First, a focus on uniquely human psychology. Um, uh, not on all the things that humans do. In your, top, if in your textbook on developmental psychology, you have things like object permanence, but other animals do those things. Basic perception, basic memory, uh, basic social interaction, other creatures do all of those things. So it's a focus on uniquely human psychology. And uniquely human psychology is established in this research program that I've been following for the last 20 odd years, comparative experiments in which we put children and our nearest primate relatives, great apes, usually chimpanzees, in the same exact experimental situation as close as possible um, and see what they do. And we try to see what is the uniquely human part. Then uh, the second uh, um, aspect of the theory that makes it Vygotskyan is the socioculture. It focuses on sociocultural skills and interactions. These fall into two categories, transmission from adults to children, cultural learning, pedagogy, uh, and uh, all the things of a culture that children have to learn from language to everything else. Uh, secondly, our coordination. So uh, these are sometimes with adults, but later in ontogeny, you have to coordinate with peers who are no more competent than yourself. So collaboration and cooperative communication, where we have to do mental coordination. We have to read one another's minds and get our heads in the same place so we can collaborate. Um, and so the neo Vygotskyan part is that uh, we want to talk about biological capacities. Uh, Vygotsky didn't talk much about that, but we want to talk about the evolution from uh, great apes to humans, to humans, and we want to know what kinds of capacities developed that enable humans to become members of a culture in a way that great apes uh, do not. Um, so this requires biological capacities expressed in development. Developmental psychology has always had the nature nurture problem uh, as a basic one. And uh, my conceptualization of it here is that uh, what is um, uh, inherited biologically are capacities. If a child, human child were born on a desert island, no interaction with other human beings at all. Nobody to teach them, nobody to socially learn from, no language, no books, no anything. As an adult, that child would have cognitive skills roughly comparable to other apes. Um, uh, they require th those capacities will wither and atrophy if they're not exercised in development. But if they're exercised in sociocultural interaction with others, in communication, cooperation, social learning, uh, then uh, you can develop into a human being. So biological capacities expressed in development. Um, now, one adaptation for a cultural way of life is that human ontogeny is much slower than that of other apes. And in adulthood, the human brain is roughly three times larger than that of other apes. But taking account of that um, and uh, controlling for that, great apes get to their adult brain size very quickly. So if you look at this graph at around two years of age, Great apes are already at 90% of their full brain growth. Human children at two years old are only at about 50% and they don't get to 90% until they're about eight years old. So development is extremely slow. Um, great apes, uh, as soon as the child is weaned, they're on their own to get their food. Now you may see nature films that give you the otherwise other impression, but it's not true. Uh, human, uh, I mean, uh, chimpanzee babies, uh, juveniles, from the time they wean at around four years of age, they're on their own for food. Mothers aren't offering them things or showing them where food is, they're on their own. And human children, uh, they don't actually um, manage to bring in enough resources to feed themselves, even in hunter-gatherer societies until well into adolescence. And in our contemporary uh, weird societies, um, uh, uh, past adolescence in many cases. Okay, but the point is that this slow development is made possible by the massive amounts of parental investment that uh, human adults, 
human parents put into their children as compared with other apes. And we protect them and feed them, and so they can just learn over all that development. The evolved biological capacities that are underlying this development, um, I have focused on a theoretical set of theoretical constructs that I borrowed from philosophers of um, action called shared intentionality. So if you look all the way to the left here, great apes are evolved mainly for competition. They are always trying to figure out what the other guy's doing and how they can get the better of him or her uh, in getting to more resources. They have a little bit of cooperation. I don't mean they don't have any, but their cooperation is typically within the context of competition. So they sometimes team up and have fights over food and whatnot. And there are some uh, uh, slightly more cooperative things, but uh, for current purposes, I'm gonna say they're mainly competitive. Um, what happened in human evolution is that somewhere around a half a million years ago, humans were forced into an ecological niche where they had to collaborate to get food or starve. Uh, they started hunting for large game and gathering plant resources that required collaboration. Uh, and any individual who couldn't collaborate would not make it or would not leave many offspring. And so they were at a huge disadvantage. So there was strong ecological pressure to develop the skills and competencies, the capacities for being able to cooperate with others. These are both cognitive skills for communicating and coordinating. Uh, and they're also um, social skills such as uh, sharing the spoils of your collaboration fairly, doing your part in the collaboration. So you had to be a good collaborator or you wouldn't be chosen as a partner. I actually don't have this written down here, but part of this process is social selection, where uh, it's an important part of it is that you choose your partners. And if you're not a good collaborator, you don't get chosen. And if you don't get chosen, you're going to have trouble getting enough to eat. Uh, and then a second step is adaptations for culture. And collaboration is, I call joint intentionality between individuals. We put our heads together to form a joint intention to do something together. We're, we form a joint intention to hunt antelopes together this afternoon. Or uh, the second step is culture. These are adaptations not for collaborating with an individual, but for operating in the context of a cultural group. So modern human individuals, contemporary human individuals, have adaptations for both collaborating with other individuals and participating in a cultural group. And in ontogeny, these are uh, expressed as maturational capacities uh, that enable children to start developing the requisite skills. In the book, um, I, uh, it has eight substantive chapters and then on each side of it some um, um, theoretical and discussion material. But the eight substantive chapters, four of them are on uniquely social ontogeny, four of them are on uniquely, cogn uniquely, hum uniquely human social ontogeny and uniquely human cognitive ontogeny. In uniquely human social ontogeny, uh, collaboration, prosociality, social norms, moral identity, uniquely human cognitive ontogeny, social cognition, communication, uh, cultural learning, cooperative thinking. Um, so uh, the uh, actual, in some sense, the largest claim of the theory is that these two biological capacities mature and put children in a position to start learning new kinds of things. The first one for collaboration and joint intentionality at around nine months of age. That's when sometimes called the nine month revolution, uh, joint attention, gestural communication like pointing where we have to coordinate our attention around uh, external entities um, and uh, the initial sort of collaboration skills. And then at around three years of age, uh, the capacities for collective intentionality, group minded intentionality, cultural groups, uh, it, uh, it matures at around three years of age. Now these are again maturations and on a desert island they wouldn't come to anything, but these are maturational capacities that enable children to start interacting with others in certain ways and it is those interactions themselves that are the cause of developmental change and progress, uh, but they couldn't take place without the capacities or the actual social interactions themselves, you need both. Okay, so let's talk about the shared intentionality schema. 
and I call it the dual level structure. And this applies at both the level of joint and collective intentionality. I use the term shared intentionality uh, to cover both. And the dual level structure means the following. Here's what has to happen. Cognitively, I'm going to give you a color coded thing here. Uh, the blue is uh, cognitive. Uh, sorry, sorry. The blue is sociomoral relations, social relations. And here's what we do. We form a joint goal to let's say hunt for antelope this afternoon. And I'm going to play role X and you're going to play role Y. So you look down at the bottom here, collaboration and sociomoral relations. Uh, during this collaboration toward a joint goal, uh, each with our own role, uh, is characterized by the spirit of cooperation, equality, fairness, and so forth. And I'm going to actually demonstrate that. This is not just an assumption. It's uh, something I'm going to try to demonstrate. That when young children are collaborating with others, they become more cooperative. They're in a more cooperative mindset than when they're not. So this is a kind of a hint that maybe this is the evolutionary, the natural evolutionary home um, of, uh, of this cooperative way of doing things. Now, the second dimension is the more cognitive dimension. And there, when we're pursuing a joint goal together, uh, we have to get into joint attention. We have to uh, see things together that are relevant to our joint goal so we can coordinate and we have to communicate in order to gain joint attention. I see something that's relevant to our um, antelope that we're hunting. Maybe there's a watering hole over there and I pointed out to you saying that he's probably headed in that direction. So we need to jointly attend to it to coordinate our uh, activities. And you have your perspective on the, on the joint attentional scene and I have my perspective. So we're both looking at the lake, but I'm looking at it from over here behind the tree and you're looking at it from over there on the other side of the field. All right, so joint attention and mental coordination is about perspectives and I'll get to this later, but recursive uh, perspectives. I can take your perspective and I can take your perspective on my perspective. Okay, so I'm just gonna say a few things. I've made this fairly short because I know that watching Zoom talks is uh, a little exhausting. So um, I'm gonna just say a few things about each of these um, in uh, early development. All right, so this is the socio-moral side now. Uh, so we're, gonna th we're thinking about the, in some ways, the motivational uh, side of things and the relationship among individuals when they're collaborating. So the first um, about dual level collaboration, the first is to let's look at a collaboration and let's look at some motivational things here. So this is a study by Felix Varnikin and um, they're coordinating. This is an 18 month old uh, child and they're coordinating in a collaborative activity. Um, and Felix is uh, pre-programmed to go into a kind of a still face and not do his part and see the child now um, okay, started to do something else then. Okay, now he's gonna stop. So he's not cooperating. Now, what does the child do? He could, the, the child could sort of send it down there and have fun, they could quit, but no, the communicating to get the, uh, get Felix back, coming over and trying to get it back, come do your thing, do your thing, we're playing this game, okay? So the child expects the adult to do her thing and to play her part. Now, this is not the same task. Chimpanzees didn't really play that one very well. Here's a different one. These are, this is a human raised chimpanzee about four years old. And what you'll see is the chimp needs to pull up that uh, door that she's um, uh, got in her hand now. And the human can reach through and grab the food. So they need to collaborate each doing their own role to do this. And the human is gonna stop in the middle of it as Felix did in the last study. So the chimp is pulling it up. All right, she stopped. And so he doesn't know what, uh, this is Annette, the, a female chimp. She doesn't know what to do. And so she comes around and she doesn't try to communicate and get the human to do her part. She just muscles her aside and tries to reach through herself and see if she can do it herself. She's not engaged with her partner in a way that says, I expect you to play your part and I can communicate so you will. Okay, and they actually succeed. Okay, they succeed, but um, the, kind of engagement that goes on there um, is different. Um, the motivation for the human child is to get the other guy to play and the chimp is just what we call using the other as a social tool and you'll see that again in just a second. All right, the social tool interpretation is made clear 
uh, in this study. So these are two three-year-old children and they have a stick down at the bottom of this step-like apparatus and there is a reward. It's a marble that they have to take somewhere and cash out. You'll actually see that at the very end. And they each have to pull up together on this stick up the stair up the stairway and then they get to the holes. But we have rigged it so that the little girl on the left is going to get her reward first and the little girl on the right, her hole is blocked and you can't, she can't get hers unless they both work together to lift it up to the top step. Right? And you're going to see what happens when uh, um, that happens. So they're lifting it up together. They really don't, haven't noticed the, the uh, holes really yet, or that girl has noticed her. But... Okay, they have to lift it up. They have to coordinate a little bit here. Okay, now the girl on the left gets her um, marble and she could take it over and cash it in. But the girl on the right says, look, okay, I have a problem here. She now notices the problem. She has the marble in her hand. She hasn't cashed it in yet. She helps the other girl get to the end. Now she gets hers and now they can both cash it in and be excited about it. So the cashing it in, you heard a little bling. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I had a friend who watched this who said, it's not like the girl on the left is being uh, nice. Uh, you could say that, but what, but it's the activity's not over until you've gotten all the way up and both of you've gotten your awards. When chimpanzees did this, um, uh, anyone who knows anything about chimpanzees will know whether it's a food reward or a token or whatever it is, if they're working together, they were working together in a similar apparatus, pulling this thing up. And as soon as the first one got the reward, they got it and they were out of it. And the other one was left stranded. So this, I think, says something really important about the motivations with which they are collaborating. These little girls are doing it together and it's not over until they both get their reward. The chimps are using each other as social tools. They know they need the other one to get the reward and we have various uh, experimental conditions showing that. Um, but once they get their reward, it's over. Okay, they bail out. Uh, just mentioned there's a control condition where, where the little girl on the right needs help and uh, the other girl comes and helps her, which they will do outside of collaboration, but they collaborate much more frequently inside of collaboration than otherwise. Now, okay, that was the working part. That was the working together, but what about in uh, sharing the spoils of the collaboration? Um, now, anybody who has any three-year-olds at home or knows much about three-year-olds knows that uh, if you hand three-year-olds some uh, reward of some kind and say, oh, share whatever you want with your uh, friend over here, they're not that generous. Uh, you might even say they're a little bit on the stingy side. Uh, but our hypothesis was that uh, the problem there is a kind of an endowment effect. The children have the things in their hand. They don't like to share them. They don't like to give up anything. So we thought, what about in collaboration? Okay, so the rewards are not owned by anybody ahead of time and we work together for them. Maybe that would generate a little more sense of fairness. So these two little boys, uh, the little German boys are gonna pull this in together and you can see the rewards, the marbles down at the bottom. You'll see them more clearly in just a minute and they're gonna pull together and then watch what happens. Whoops, three go to one side and one goes to the other. And the little child on the right gives up one of them so they'll have the same. And then they cash them in in their little thing, bling, bling. Okay, now this is important. This is what the economists call um, an aversion to advantageous inequity. This little boy got more and he gave the other kid one. He got three, the other kid got one. He gave him one to equalize. Now he didn't give him all three of them. If he was really a nice guy and just being empathetic or whatever, he would have given him more than one. No, he gave him one to equalize. And children almost always gave one to equalize. These are the best data I ever got. Uh, these children um, uh, gave up one uh, marble, 80% of the trials. Now the control condition, we had a couple of different controls, but the starkest comparison is they came into the room and there were already three on one side and one on the other side. And then they share about 11% of the time. The, the distributions didn't even overlap. Okay, so 
I think the title of this paper is something like collaboration facilitates equal sharing in children, but as you might expect, not chimpanzees. So chimpanzees don't really share that actively. And so we had to concoct a situation where this would work. And what we did was they pulled together um, and uh, I got two and the other guy got one. And then there was one in the middle and I, the one who got two, could sort of work to prevent the other guy from getting it. And then I could work a little bit to get it or I could just leave it alone and let him have it. And the question was, in an experimental condition where they worked collaboratively, would I let him have it because he deserves it? Um, or uh, would I gather it for myself because I want all I can have? As compared to a control condition where we didn't collaborate, would I then be less um, generous uh, then than I would in the collaboration condition? But with chimpanzees condition didn't matter. So children, it's 80 to 11. 80% to 11% sharing and chimps, it's a fairly low level, uh, but it's the same in both. And it's not, a, it's not a floor effect. It's a fairly low effect in both. We managed to um, um, do that. Okay, so those are, the, the, the proposal is, and I have a recent behavioral and brain sciences paper on uh, the, the moral psychology of obligation, where I give extensive amounts of evidence that children are doing this out of arguably a sense of obligation that we work together, we both deserve it, and so I should share um, equally. And the main um, uh, empirical thrust of that paper is that you don't see this in children outside of collaboration. You see it only in collaboration. Okay, so that's this. That's the joint goal with the role, the two different roles, and I've just been talking about how they relate to one another. Now, the green part is the cognitive part, the joint attention, perspectives, and coordinating our perspectives. So now let's talk about that part of this joint, this shared intentionality schema, the cognitive part. So um, I mentioned the nine month revolution uh, has been studied for a long time. <laughs> My first publication in psychology in 1983. So whatever that is, um, uh, 30 odd years ago, um, had joint attention in the title. So I've been studying that for a long time, mainly in the context of communication. Uh, but I'm gonna show you three behaviors here. And these are all short little videos, uh, two of them home videos. Uh, and they are, um, I'm gonna show you first collaboration. Now, a key thing to, watch for is to watch the child's gaze direction here. So I'm going to roll this ball back and forth. Okay. Uh, and I roll it to her and she's going to roll it back and look up at me. By the way, this is her nine month birthday. Exactly. And that's why I'm so excited. We thought we'd try on her nine month birthday. Uh, so she's collaborating, rolling the ball back and forth and looking up at my face as she does. So and there she rolls it again. And I'm just I'm saying, make sure you get this on camera, please. Nine month birthday. And you see the look, you can see the look to the face the whole time. Okay. I have a thing with chimpanzee uh, that I don't have time to show you where they like playing with the ball. Uh, they grab it from the other person. They sometimes put it in the other person's lap, but they're not rolling back and forth and they're not sharing attention back and forth. Okay. Now here's a very quick video down at the bottom showing this is a behavior, a very simple behavior that emerges at nine months. This child's a little, a month or two older than nine months, but the same idea. And uh, here, this is a very common behavior in young children. So here it is, we'll watch quickly. That's it. They're just showing it. And pointing would be the same. Look over there, look at that birdie over there. The only motivation is just to share attention. Children are motivated to share attention on things, just like we're motivated to tell our friends stuff. I mean, the whole motivation behind uh, uh, Wikipedia and Facebook is I want to share stuff with other people. What, what other motivation is there? So they're motivated to share and they have to coordinate to join attention. So I want you to look at what I'm looking at and I want you to appreciate it. So um, we actually have done a study a long, some years ago uh, where um, if you react to things like the showing or pointing uh, by just sort of going, meh, they don't really like that. They want you to share attention and express uh, the same emotion. And finally, this is a classic book reading uh, kind of um, situation. Uh, 
where you can see the mom pointing to a picture. And um, uh, the, the, all I'm really showing you this here is joint attention in the sense that the kid is looking at the book, but then mom says, starts you know, saying stuff and, and the child strains to turn around and look to make eye contact. Uh, so there, so there we go. All right, and then points. Right. So I got to make sure you're looking before I point. If you're not looking, there's no point in pointing. <laughs> okay. All right. And so, and now, now that look is to the sibling uh, who's holding the camera. So we're going to share with the sibling too. Uh, okay. So, so this is the kind of engagement that you do not see in chimpanzees. I have videos I could show you. They're doing all kinds of intelligent things. They are social. They form attachments, but they don't do this. They don't, the two of us share attention to a third thing. That's this triangle. You and me sharing attention to a third thing. You with your perspective, me with my perspective. And so if we're going to act on it, we have to coordinate our perspectives. So here's a way of coordinating roles and perspectives. And you're going to see what the child does here. This is a tube with a toy inside and the child knows there's a toy inside and they have to pull on the two ends to pull it apart. Um, and again, this is uh, Felix Varnikin. This is from the same study that I showed you a moment ago, but I'm showing you this because I want you to see what the child does when he doesn't do his part here. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, he's going to point to him to coordinate. He's going to tell him what he needs to do for them to be successful. So this is the context of this kind of cooperative communication where I inform you of things is you doing your part helps us reach our joint goal. So Felix is programmed to not act for 15 seconds. That's why he's delaying. And then he does what the little boy tells him to do 18 months and out comes the toy and they're successful. So the boy uh, um, helped accomplish joint attention by saying the, the, the Felix is looking at him and he says, no, look, look down there and you'll see the end of this tube and you'll know you need to pull on it. Right? So we're coordinating attention, coordinating perspectives and the chimps uh, uh, um, don't, don't, one of the, one of the findings we've probably done more than a dozen studies of, of, of co collaboration in chimpanzees. And one of the most noticeable things is that they almost never do anything to communicate when they're coordinating. And I don't mean they have to do something complicated, not language, not even pointing, but just banging on the end of something to get the guy to come over and do it or something. And they just don't do it. So they, their communication is not um, ad uh, adapted for um, coordinating attention in collaboration. It's adapted for other things. Uh, another place is coordinating perspectives in communicative acts. And uh, this is a little study that we've done a bunch of. And so this is just one exemplar of the comprehension of pointing. Now, this is a 12 month old pre-linguistic mostly. Um, and she is gonna get him interested in this. And then she's gonna obscure it from his view in her hand. She's gonna call his name to get him centered so that he looks straight at her to begin. She, she Sorry, she hides them. He doesn't know where, she centers him, he looks up at her and she points and he finds it. Now you can say, well, you know, what's so great about that? Of course, she pointed to it. She told him where it was, she showed him where it was. Well, I invite you to go to your local zoo and take any creature there you want and point for them to say there's some food over there or you know, there's a predator over there and they won't get it. They're not, the pointing is human. It's not, it's, I mean, it's not, they're not, it's not, they're not getting it because they don't communicate perfectly well among themselves. It's just that this pointing, this directing attention is not something that's part of their repertoire. If you want to gloss the communicative import of pointing, I would say when I point to something, it's basically look over there and you'll know what I mean. So she's saying, look over there and you'll know what I mean. It's relevant to the search for the toy. And I can just show you again, I say various studies because we've done this a number of different ways. Um, you can see what happens here. Okay, so um, the, the, the voice over there for this little TV spot was saying uh, the chimp doesn't understand the cooperative motivation. She's trying to help me find it. And I do think that's part of the, uh, of the um, 
troubles they have in this study. Um, but in addition, they have troubles with mental coordination of this joint attention type. So, um, so here is the situation where somebody is pointing and this little dotted line, they're pointing to the bucket. That's what it, that's supposed to depict. And then down at the bottom, the baby, the solid line coming out of the baby's head there is meant to show that they're looking somewhere else. And the other person points and they shift attention to now look at the same thing. So joint attention requires me to understand that at the beginning, I'm not looking at what you're looking at. I'm not attending to what you're attending to. And I need to go over and match yours. So there's a coordination involved. And the opposite of that would be that I only point to things when, so now just switch the baby picture and the adult picture. I only, I point to things when I know that you're not looking at it and I want you to join me and jointly attend to it with me. So even the very simple act of pointing has mental coordination in it. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, based on um, going all the way back to Grice, uh, the philosopher of language, but also uh, Sperber and Wilson relevance theory, I myself have a version of this uh, approach that it's recursive. So the child is saying, what does she intend for me to know? Or what does she intend for me to attend to? And even that little simple pointing experiment, uh, the child has to know that. What does she intend for me to attend to? And I think the apes can't do the recursion either. So they don't coordinate perspectives and they don't coordinate perspectives recursively. Uh, so this is important now. Um, uh, um, I am author on some papers that say that apes are really good at something like mind reading, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, they understand what others know, they understand what others see, uh, perhaps even beliefs, but that's a little uh, contentious. Uh, myself, I'm not so sure about that. But I just want to point out that this is not just reading the other one's mind. This is coordinating your mind with their mind. All right? And that, I want to say, is an adaptation for collaboration and cooperation in general that characterizes humans that just hasn't happened in other apes because the other apes did not evolve to engage in collaborative foraging and they didn't have the need to coordinate their mental states in that way or to communicate in order to coordinate mental states. This transitions smoothly into language. Language is the dual level structure of, convention, uh, of, of discourse. Uh, so we coordinate topic and comment. So you and I are talking about a particular topic. Let's say we're discussing, uh, uh, I don't know what, uh, discussing the life of bees. I'm, uh, uh, we have, I have a bee thing, thing right outside my door here. Uh, 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 we're discussing bees. That's our topic. I say, yeah, you know, bees produce a lot of honey. You say, uh, we used to have a beehive back uh, in my uh, childhood home uh, and we are on the same topic that's our joint attention and you make your comment your perspective I make my comment my perspective so the structure of human conversation and discourse is exactly of this same dual level type but now we're using conventional means of doing this we're not just pointing we're using um, uh, linguistic items that you and I have both learned during our enculturation in this culture and we have to share them. I couldn't uh, talk about bees to somebody from an, another culture that spoke a completely different language. Uh, it's dependent on our group level cultural adaptation for what is called sometimes cultural common ground. I know that we all know that we all know these pieces of English and we all know that we all know all kinds of other things about our culture. So at around three years, Yes, children engage in some back and forth uh, a fair amount uh, uh, when they're still one or two, especially in weird cultures where parents are scaffolding a lot. But if you look at two children together and you ask when can they carry on a coherent conversation over multiple turns, okay, two children, two three-year-olds, if you've ever seen two three-year-olds carrying on a conversation, that yes, they can respond to what the other person said, but it's very difficult for them to carry on an extended conversation where they're each making relevant comments on a common topic. So I think it's around three years old where they sort of get the idea of this dual level structure scaled up uh, to conventional things. Uh, and this will ultimately, from the uh, to thinking of, of, of perspective, uh, this is ultimately gonna affect their cognition 
uh, such that um, this kind of perspective shifting discourse where you're saying one thing, I'm saying another thing. And it might even be that you say, uh, you know, the cat is on the mat and I say, no, he's outside. So about the same exact topic about the cat's whereabouts, you say one thing and I say you're wrong, another thing. So we have these conflicting perspectives um, uh, and seeing these perspectives from different perspectives is ultimately, seeing the same thing from different perspectives is ultimately going to lead to us the what's called linguistic aspectuality this one entity is a horse it's an animal it's a pony it's a pet we take this for granted all the models in cognitive science take this for granted but uh, i believe that other creatures including chimpanzees do not uh, view the world in terms of the same exact item uh, being uh, different things depending on how you look at it so the overall uh, uh, theory, just a little bit complicated here, but if you look at the apes individual intentionality, you get gaze following, but with nine months children, you get joint attention. So in the book, I actually start every single chapter with what apes do. And in the cases where we have ontogenetic information about the apes, I start with that. Um, and then uh, move to nine month olds and then move to three year olds, or I should say nine months to three years and then three years plus. Right, so the chimps are doing gaze following, but the nine month olds are coordinating in joint attention and three year olds are coordinating more complex perspectives like beliefs and your belief is false and mine is uh, true. Intentional communication, uh, apes do that in the gestural modality, but referential communication where you and I focus on a third topic, no. Conventional communication in language, Yes, it happens before three years of age, but uh, there's a long argument there. If you ask children uh, about how they understand conventions, they don't understand that all of us in the group know this word and people outside the group don't know it. So they don't really understand its conventional structure until three years of age. Great apes engage in social learning. Children engage in cultural learning, which is a little bit more sophisticated, involving perspectives. Uh, and at three plus years, they understand pedagogy for what it is, that it's uh, in the a theory of uh, Chibra and Gergé that it's a pedagogical learning is about generic things, culturally generalizable knowledge. Uh, they coordinate with others in cooperative thinking where they critique one another's thinking and solve problems, all of that in late preschool basically. In the social domain, group action leads to collaboration, leads to joint commitment. Helping leads to pro-social behavior with a number of special qualities that I don't have time to go into, but human pro-social behavior has some special qualities. Chimps do engage in helping, but not uh, certain kinds of helping. Uh, and uh, ultimately into fair sharing of resources after three. Uh, and the social evaluation uh, is uh, similar, I think, in apes and nine month olds in the very, they know who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. Uh, but then after three years of age, uh, young children are following social norms and actually enforcing social norms on others, which they do from a group perspective uh, and some kind of moral values that they share with the group. Um, last uh, 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 contentful slide here. Um, uh, everyone is very much concerned with cross-cultural work these days and including all kinds of uh, 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 peoples in their studies. And we have not done that systematically in all the studies that I showed you. They're mainly uh, weird children, mostly middle-class German children uh, and some middle-class American children. Uh, but uh, we have started some cross-cultural work and it builds on something we did a number of years ago with Tara Callahan uh, uh, was the lead author on this, um, where we looked at the very beginning things like one to two years old. Uh, so we're not talking about everyone agrees. I think one thing everyone could agree on in cross-cultural developmental psychology is that children are more similar when they're infants and babies and toddlers and they become more differentiated as they get older into early and middle childhood and adolescence. I think that's just common sense. And so the one cross-cultural, systematic cross-cultural study that I will share with you here, uh, and we're working on a number of others, we have a couple of others published too, but this is, is just that at one to two years of age, so this is the nine month revolution, the very young babies are very similar across three cultures that are very different. So the Canadian culture is a weird middle-class culture. Uh, Peru, uh, these are from a small um, non-literate uh, traditional community. In India, it's also a different uh, traditional non-literate community in the rural part of the world. They, kids typically don't have toys, they don't have books, et cetera, et cetera. So 
um, all those dashes mean the age of emergence for, for all three were the same, wherever their dashes. So it, the pointing, the Canadian children did it a little bit earlier. The collaboration, the Indian children did a little bit earlier. Everything else was the same age of emergence. And we had a bunch of different measures for each of these. Imitation, intention reading, gaze following, pointing, collaboration, joint attention. We had a number of different measures for each of them. Of the ones I've talked about here, joint attention and collaboration and pointing are the most relevant. And even when uh, the Canadians were slightly higher than the Indians and the Indians were slightly higher than the Canadians, we're talking about like a few months. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, so what I want to argue to you is that um, this is the biological capacity uh, of joint intentionality at nine months expressing itself in different cultures in roughly the same way with maybe some minor variations. Now, when we get to three years old and older, where we're getting to an understanding of my cultural group and how to be, fit into my cultural group and do things the way my cultural group does them, ultimately learning my group's social norms, um, then um, uh, that's gonna be a different story. Now we're gonna get a lot of cultural differences. Uh, but this is the starting point. The starting point is universals of um, capacities for becoming a member of a culture, um, and then they're going to differentiate as the kids go further and further in ontogeny. So to conclude, uniquely human cognition and sociality emerge early in ontogeny in two steps, the nine-month revolution, joint intentionality, the three-year, what I've sometimes called the objective normative turn, thinking about um, how things ought to be and things that are true versus false and the right way to do them and the wrong way to do them, starts emerging at around three years of age. And, and by the time they get to school age, um, it's pretty well entrenched. And the explanation is transactional. It's a maturational capacities uh, are exercised. Uh, and uh, they are exercised uh, in what I can call here in a general way shared intentionality experiences, that is sociocultural experiences like joint attention and collaboration. And, uh, and they ultimately engage in social normative self-regulation, which again, I didn't get into exactly here, uh, but I mentioned my behavior and brain sciences paper on obligation. Ultimately, when we are interacting and I am feeling you as a partner who deserves the same sharing of the spoils as me and that I should work as hard as you do to um, deserve the spoils also, that this starts to engender a sense of obligation that of what I owe to my collaborative partner by virtue of our collaboration. Okay, so thank you very much. That's, uh, that's the story again, and I thank you very much for the award, and I uh, thank you for your time. Thank you.